The Be Rad Podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend now available on Amazon. Bala Enzyme, electrolyte and triple enzyme recovery drink mix. Paleo Valley, nutrient-rich ancestral-inspired health products. By Optimizers, performance supplements like magnesium, probiotics, and more. And B-Rad Whey Protein Super Fuel, coming soon. Stay tuned for details. And please visit bradkearns.com to check out my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. And here we go with the show. But I think we have to be aware of the fact that people with their different filters can take information the wrong way. Most people still don't have a good sense of what's happening to their muscle mass. So basically, as they're doing these diets and they're aiming for the number on the scale to go down, they're not aware that they are losing significant months of muscle mass, maybe in their legs or other parts of their body. And we know that muscle mass is correlated with longevity. Studies show that these swings in glucose, they can create tremendous adrenal stress. It causes an increase in catecholamines and stress hormones in the body because our body likes to be stable. Our brain likes to see, obviously you're gonna get normal glucose fluctuations, but when those are exaggerated, our brain does not like that. Hey listeners, I discovered an awesome new electrolyte and triple enzyme powdered drink that's going to knock your socks off. It's called Bala Enzyme, and it comes in a convenient little pouch of bright orange powder that you pour into water for the ultimate electrolyte and antioxidant drink. It's simple, convenient, and yes, the orange tint comes from a potent serving of turmeric along with a clean and diverse assortment of enzymes and electrolytes and a perfect taste that's not fake or too sweet. Bala was created by husband and wife doctors to help their patients recover from inflammation, improve hydration, speed up recovery, even relieve joint pain, improve digestion, and boost immunity. I love their incredible devotion to product quality. There's a lot of research behind it, and I just sprinkle this packet into ice water, and it's so easy to stay hydrated because you absolutely enjoy the taste of the drink. Get their convenient little packets. They even designed it with the uh, the tear half torn so it's easy to open into the water. I love what they think of. And it comes in three exciting flavors, pineapple, lime, and berry. It's so potent, it might stain your fingers if you get it on your fingers. And yes, that's a good thing for a serving of turmeric that's that potent. It's also sugar-free, zero carb, and promoting of the three R's, rehydrate. Relieve and revive. Please visit balaenzyme.com, B A L A E N Z Y M E. And of course, there's a special deal for B Rad Podcast listeners 30% off your first order. Just use the code B R A D 30 at balaenzyme.com. Hi, listeners. What a pleasure it is to welcome back to the show Dr. Ron Sinha. This is technically his fourth appearance on the show. We had a talk a long time ago about mindset and medicine. We did a breather show where I kept the tape recorder going. And then we talked about how to beat the covesity pandemic a little bit ago. And now we're on for a wide ranging and very interesting show about all manner of healthy living and especially highlighting his wonderful new venture, which is the Meta Health podcast hosted by Dr. Ron Sinha. Go look it up and binge on a few great episodes. He spends a lot of time preparing a very smooth and informative lecture style. So he's not interviewing guests just yet, but he's laying a wonderful foundation of science and giving you uh, a great way to understand some of these complex scientific topics about metabolism and health by a storytelling strategy where he draws analogies and helps you picture uh, what's going on inside your body when you can easily get lost in the uh, the science and the tech. So if you listen to a few episodes of the Meta Health podcast, it's like getting a free college education, you're absolutely going to love it. And his topics range from uh, learning how fat burning works in the body, learning how muscle building works in the body, how important it is to maintain muscle mass throughout life. So he's one of the guys uh, with a loud voice saying that this is possibly uh, the number one way to promote longevity, fitness, and uh, an enjoyable 
enjoyable, happy, healthy, active life. Uh, he also is really strong on bringing in the mental health aspects as a fundamental component of overall health and also how mental health affects physical health. So his articles at his wonderful blog, culturalhealthsolutions.com, uh, about rumination are definitely worth reading and they're really unforgettable. Uh, the way this uh, modern lifestyle affliction of rumination, envy, topics like that, stacking right up with a deep scientific discussion about how, to, how mitochondria work in the body. You're only going to get that on the Meta Health Podcast with Dr. Ron Sinha. So today, uh, when we finished the recording, I had this insight that um, what we did was we gave a lot of real-life application to the scientific principles that uh, were mentioned. And so I think with all this knowledge and information hitting us, we also can't forget the importance of the practical application of all these things and how to develop the motivation, the focus. And so I think you're going to enjoy this conversational uh, podcast uh, with a lot of good takeaways. One of them is the importance of being wary of scientific studies and the headlines that we read every day and we're bombarded with um, the, the, the takeaways and the sound bites and the insights taken out of context. Uh, we suffer from health experts promoting their way as the ultimate and criticizing and having a lot of infighting going on. So one thing he mentions is that uh, the observational study on diet, which is uh, how most studies are organized, observational being uh, asking people to fill out a questionnaire of how they typically eat and draw major conclusions from that. Uh, one of them that he uh, took to task was this uh, widespread uh, belief and widespread commentary that uh, red meat can cause cancer and those who eat more red meat have a higher risk of cancer. And he points out correctly that um, in the presence of a highly processed High insulin producing diet. Yes, red meat and other saturated fat are going to do bad things. So will eating too much protein. And we have these warnings about excess protein that are now being considered to be overblown by a lot of experts, including Dr. Ron. And he mentioned one study in particular in Italy where they tracked a very healthy population eating that Mediterranean diet and saw the opposite conclusion that the more animal protein they ate, which is the highest uh, bioavailable, the easiest to assimilate, the healthier they get. Oh my gosh. So you're going to, you're going to love that. It's going to help you process a lot of this uh, scientific reference that you get hit with. Uh, I was also particularly interested to discuss the topic of how it's possible to overdose on adrenaline stimulating activities. So these hormetic stressors that are so highly touted as being wonderful, cold exposure, high intensity interval training, hitting it hard with the tough workouts. Ron talked about how he got so into the uh, Wim Hof breathing techniques that that was another source of stress. You know, it prompts that uh, wonderful adrenaline response where you feel pumped up and feel great. But if you start stacking these together, which I've talked about too on previous shows, oh boy, it can really get out of hand and lead to exhaustion and burnout. And Dr. Ron working in Silicon Valley works with a lot of type A folks who thinks more is better. I will raise my hand here. And uh, I, I off offered up how my cold exposure uh, got more and more ambitious and it kind of got out of hand where the stress was a, a bit too much. And so we can kind of tone things down, mix and match, throw in these uh, tools rather than get uh, obsessed with putting up big numbers, uh, fasting for too long. We spent a lot of time talking about the dangers of fasting to excess and how it can be counterproductive, especially when you start to lose muscle mass because you're getting undernourished. We talked about the benefits of using a continuous glucose monitor, and we also talked the uh, the best way to track long-term health and longevity status, which is the combination of the metrics, the blood work and the, the doctor's examinations, as well as athletic performance metrics. And we highlighted the famous test from the Cooper Institute and Texas A&M, the one mile run, and tracking that as a profound longevity predictor, along with many other things. So if you have something that you love doing and you keep trying it and you go back and put up do new numbers um, over the years, that'll be a great way to track how things are working for you. That was a long intro, but I want this to be a fast-moving show and give you properly prepared for all the information that's coming at you from Dr. Ron Sinha. Here we go, host of the new Meta Health Podcast. 
Dr. Ron Sinha, welcome back. I am so glad to connect with you. And now we have some big matters to talk about. How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's so good to be back connecting with you. Um, so recent exciting news from your corner is the launch of the Meta Health Podcast, one of my favorite. It's incredible. Oh, that's so kind of you, man. Uh, you, hey, listen, you were one of the people that had, had been, been encouraging me to do this for a long time, and I kept resisting, but I finally gave in, and it's been a blast. It's more work like you um, warned me about, but it has been super rewarding. So, so thanks for that nudge. You've always been a coach to me in the past, and so thanks for getting me to get over the hump. Yeah, I take partial credit and whatever, whatever time that uh, you, you do it is the right time. Uh, but I love the unique format. So maybe you're best to describe what's interesting and unusual about the way you dispense the information on the on the Meta Health podcast. Yeah. You know what? I think one thing we both share in common is we're passionate educators. That's what I do in my clinic. That's what I do in my programs. And I find that the more deeply individuals learn about how their body works, the science of how it works, um, it causes transformations. It's like they look at food and exercise and everything differently. And what I realized is, you know, one thing I told myself, Brad, is if I'm going to do this podcast, I want it to be different. And I want it to tap into a little bit of my creative yearning to do something that's not purely scientific. So I know the best way I learn, and believe it or not, I'm actually not I don't have a natural scientific left brain. I'm actually better at like writing and drawing and being more creative. And I was thinking that how can I really teach science to people in a way where they can actually retain the information? Because there's so much confusing science out there. And that's really where um, I decided that I would take my favorite concepts like insulin resistance, general concepts around metabolism, but I'm going to apply a lot of storytelling to it and use a lot of visual imagery. So concepts will really stick in their head. And so far, you know, I've launched it a few months ago. It's been rewarding because I've got people from lay people that don't know anything about science to people that are MD, PhDs and um, scientists that are listening to it saying, you know what, I finally understand how this works and I can actually retain it as well too. So that process has been super rewarding. It does take me a lot of time to sort of think through each mm -hmm. episode because I'm trying to be as creative as possible, but it's much more rewarding than me just putting out tons and tons of content that doesn't really have that creative spin to it. So yeah, it's been fun. I I've loved the feedback so far and I'm going to keep it going as long as I can. Yeah, I got to say, when you flip on that mic, and it's just Dr. Ron talking for 34 minutes. It, it's incredibly difficult. It's way harder than bringing a guest on and saying, tell us about your book. And then they, 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 they go to town. Um, so you, you can definitely tell the preparation and especially the, um, the, the simplifying or the, um, you know, the, the, the storytelling aspect of the science and the, the acronyms. You're the king of the acronyms, man. We got we to gotta give you credit there. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I think it's really helpful. And I've noticed like writing about this stuff for a long time and dating back to when I was first getting going with Mark Sisson and talking about, um, you know, the, the, the VLDLs, the LDL and the HDL and, and the, uh, the, the boat carrying the, uh, the molecules. Um, I, got, uh, I got astute enough to be able to write it and explain it in writing without fully understanding it myself. And I feel like there's stages of understanding and learning where you're going to, you're going to bust out some analogies. You're going to talk about the, the bus full of uh, molecules versus the a whole bunch of small cars on the highway and you can grasp it. And then five minutes later, you're like, what the heck was he just saying? And so um, the effort is, uh, you know, appreciated because to, to have things stick, I think is a whole nother level versus just nodding your head in, in class and going, I get it right now, but I might not be able to exp explain it tomorrow. Hey, listen, I turned 50 and I'm getting empathetic to the fact that things are just not sticking <laughs> like they used to, uh, let's say a decade or two ago. And my audience obviously is all, of all ages. So I think a lot of them that told me they used to remember this stuff when they were a physician or a scientist, it's really nice to be able to relearn it and have them retain it. So yeah, fun stuff. Okay. I want to pin you down on that one. Cause I'm, I'm <laughs> curious, like, you know, we're, we're getting older and these different things happen. I know physically and athletically, I have a whole different set of parameters I have to ascribe to. And in terms of recovery is the main thing that I see where I have just as impressive of a workout I, I did 30 years ago, but I'm going to be talking about it six days later where, you know, <laughs> my, my son and his prime will do, let's say a similar workout. And then the next morning he wakes up and, um, you know, it, it's over and he's on to the next workout. But as far as 
as cognitively, um, you know, I feel like you've done a lot of writing in your life, like I, and I feel like I'm a better writer. Um, I'm crisper and more, um, you know, a, a better flow, but I don't have anywhere near the staying power to be cranking away for six hours straight. So I think that's, that's one trade-off that I noticed, but overall, when you say you just turned 50 and you're not, you're not as sharp, what do you, what do you really see there? If anything? Yeah, I mean, I think the memory is a big part of it because I feel like I was able to get through volumes of information and listen to things and it would just stick much better. And part of this might also be an element of distractibility because, um, you know, there's just so <laughs> oh, many things. Oh, jeez, we forgot right? about that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, when we're younger, d- despite, you know, of being distractible to some degree, our brain is developed in a way that it can actually grab and hold on to information and um, store that more effectively than as we get older. So I've had to be more methodical about the way I consume um, and actually um, create information or do writing. Because even though like maybe my teenagers, you know, I see sometimes they can do a lot, they can have the text dinging on the side while they're doing other things. And I wouldn't say that's optimal at all. But for me, it's like uh, an absolute no brainer, literally. It's like my brain will not be able to focus on my next podcast or writing without me absolutely protecting that time. I I remembered when the kids were younger, I could still, like I wrote the book when I had twins and the twins were nice and young and I was still able to sort of, sort of pump content out. But now for like these podcast episodes, it's it's almost a meditative process where I've got to really protect myself. And I think those of us that are listening that are trying to do something, whether it's starting up a business, um, you know, doing your own blog, whatever, I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, I'm not saying everyone's in the same boat. Maybe there are 50, 60, 70 plus year olds that can do deep work while they're being distracted a little bit from, but most of us, I think we really, really need that protective time and just treat it like a meditation. And, and you feel so much better. I think the quality of work I put out is much better now than it was before. Cause I'm much more disciplined about that. Oh my gosh, that's great. And I, I agree. And, um, yeah, it may be a generational thing where we had half of our lives to, uh, have a much easier time focusing, because there wasn't much going on besides your medical school textbook. Uh, cheers coming on Thursday night at 8 p.m. You can't miss that. But otherwise, you're not flipping channels. And, uh, you know, the, the great outdoors to go exercise. There wasn't this constant overload of uh, entertainment possibilities. Um, but I also think, yeah, we, we, have to, we have to watch that in modern times now because um, it's, it's highly destructive, all this hyperconnectivity and distractibility. And I'm, I'm really sensitive to it as well. I can't have any music or sound going on in the background, or it drives me nuts when I'm trying to work. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to not get good at multitasking. I know you've written about this topic too, and, um, it's, it's a battle, but it's worth, it's worth fighting in that sense. Um, Cal Newport talks about the advantage you can get in, in the competitive setting of, of the career track by, by getting good at deep work where everyone else is, of course, they're answering all their, their texts and emails all day long, but you're the one that created the, the 12 page PowerPoint proposal. That's going to blow everybody away, you know? Totally, totally. And, and you know, it, it's interesting because it, it, for those of you that are sort of in this media space or trying to do blogs, podcasts, et cetera, if you talk to a traditional marketer, they really talk about volume of content, right? It's like put out a post every single day, you know, just put up top 10. And, you know, I kind of got sucked into that for a little bit, Brad. I'm like, God, I'm not putting out enough. And it was just very superficial, scratchy stuff that didn't feel very meaningful to me. And same with the podcast. I'm like, I'm just not going to put pressure on myself to just put out one or two episodes a week or like people are putting out sometimes episodes daily. And I got caught up in that because I thought volume was everything. But but the minute I gave myself the space to say, you know what, when my brain's ready, I'm going to do it. But when I do it, I'm going to go deep. And um, and as a result of that, I think when people find it, you know, again, I don't have millions and millions of uploads, downloads, whatever. But when people find it, they're like, this is really different than what I've heard before. And to me, that's really rewarding. You know, we'll see how it works in terms of its growth and spread. But but I think all of us want to get a unique voice out there. And you're not going to find that voice if it's just superficial pump out volume every single day, right? It just um, it, it gets diluted out then. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I agree. You're the um, your unique voice is the, the thoughtful and uh, one that takes it into depth. I love it. That's a great, it's a great niche to try to claim rather than the, the volume guy. And also I got to say um, the meta health podcast is, is one of the only where you're going to look at shows with the diverse topics like 
mitochondrial health and the science, and then uh, envy uh, the, the topic of uh, you know the, the emotions and the, uh, the the personal side of physical health. Rumination is one of your favorite topics, and I love your blog articles about that on cultural health solutions. Uh, but these things tie directly into um, to physical health. And I know we talked about this at length on a previous show, but maybe we could just drift there a bit as far as the um, diversity of your content and why you're covering these these uh, these these nef- field topics seemingly. Yeah, let's dig in and I, I can weave in some silly storytelling whenever appropriate. So, um, so uh, the other thing that's uh, amusing that I, I never quite thought about was when you talk about this concept um, of the success bias that comes from listening to your followers. So you, you got to tell me about that there. And uh, your quip of keeping your shirt on, I think, is, um, is precious in this context. Right. No, I think this is really key. I mean, again, after I sort of um, did that um, podcast and that post, you know, I'm definitely not against people taking their shirts off on Instagram and flexing those abs that are well deserved. Um, but, but you know, often when you look at your data and the and the feedback that you're getting from your followers, it can sort of shape you into something that you authentically are not. And I found sometimes that was happening. Sometimes I'm like, wow, so this post got a lot of you know likes and comments. So maybe I should put out more of that. But what I realized that you know what that happened on a day where I was feeling a certain way and that was my authentic self. But I just don't want to morph into that as well. And the thing is, those of us in in the health and wellness space, we have to understand that as much as our intent is always positive, sometimes we are putting out messages that can go through different filters. You know, we're Mm -hmm. taking responsibility for a very large audience. So again, if I'm flexing my abs, that's great. Maybe that's going to inspire a certain amount of population and make me feel good but it's also going to create some shame in other people. And they're going to think that unless they get a six pack, a ripping six pack, they may not have the key to longevity, happiness, and all of that. So, so, you know, I I think again, I'm not dissing on people that aren't necessarily doing that, but I think we have to be aware of the fact that people with their different filters can take information the wrong way. You know, one of the podcast episodes, probably my most listened to one is basically, have we taken fasting too far? Mm. And, you know, fasting obviously is the most popular health trend right now in the world. And, um, and, and as much as it has been a game changer for my patients when done properly, I have clearly seen so many people develop borderline to full-blown eating disorders. I'm seeing my patients that are getting older in age that are losing significant amounts of muscle mass because they're actually tracking that, yet they are so addicted to the convenience and the idea of just eating less food within a tight window, which can have its benefits when done properly. We don't realize that when people are kind of bragging about their fasting hours, and literally it's become a macho thing, like using Mm -hmm. timers and saying, hey, oh, you only did 24 hours. Uh, You know, I did a three-day fast the other week, you know? Um, And again, if you're wired to be competitive or to do a lot of self-shaming, you can use fasting in a very dangerous way that's going to actually have adverse effects on your health. So I know I moved into that without you asking me, but that just popped into my head as I was thinking about this topic. Yeah, that's huge. I I definitely want to go into that further, especially when you talked about your own uh, overdosing on the adrenaline stimulating activities. And I definitely relate to that. And I absolutely experienced that happening to me. Uh, But before I was going to ask you, um, oh, yeah, with the, um, you know, the success bias, also, anyone who's touting a particular strategy uh, and, you know, let's say you, you put up your, your best-selling book on the, uh, the plant-based eating, you're going to hear from thousands of people who purchased the book and did it and succeeded, but not the people who didn't purchase the book because they thought it was bullshit or who purchased the book and tried it and, and struggled and suffered. And so you're going to be creating this funnel for your own approach where it's just absolute. And, and same with fitness where, you know, um, there's one guy on Instagram, uh, Joel Seedman, who's talking about, you never take any movement past 90 degree 90. joint thing. Yep. And then you have knees over toes, Ben Patrick, who I'm really fond of. And I, I love his exercises and he's saying essentially the opposite. And then, you know, those two get together and talk and um, it, Joel Seedman says, well, some of my stuff's taken out of context. And so this, and so that, and um, you get really confused as a everyday consumer trying to um, do the right thing. And so I think, you know, we got to step back and realize like that the people with this um, tremendous success rate, uh, mm-hmm. is because of whatever you want to call it, attrition or attracting, attracting the people who are already adapted 
I'm, I'm rambling, but one thing I want to say is like, even in the endurance sports community, I'm now looking back after decades, realizing that this is a self-selecting community of mm. people who are adapted naturally to yep. excel and succeed and protect their health when they're running marathons and ultra marathons and everyone else drops off and it can be tremendously unhealthy for a large number of people. And then the people that do it, Hey, it's great, but they're like, they're the freaks, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's so important. It's interesting. So I find on social media, it's kind of different than leaving reviews on Yelp for your doctor or restaurant where there's more of a negative. <laughs> right. bias. That's, that's, like, those are the ones that are steamed up. They're going to write a review. Those, Totally. Yeah, totally they, yeah, they get steamed up and put the negative, but, but on social media, cause it's supposed to be a feel good atmosphere. The ones that are feeling good tend to post and comment and the other ones probably just do an eye roll and just move on to the next post. So, so I think this is really important because um, I'm so glad. Uh, and you mentioned success bias and I, I didn't dig as deeply as, as you just did, but um, it is, it's a real key thing we have to be aware of because we're spending so much time on TikTok and Instagram and all these platforms. And, and really um, as much as, you know, politics has become an extreme, um, topic nowadays, um, health and fitness is as well too. And a lot of us are being brainwashed into certain camps and we're not really seeing the other side of what's possible. So as a physician, you have that tremendous, uh, position of responsibility with your patients. And then as well as a public figure doing the podcast and, and, and communicating, um, how do you navigate these rough roads uh, in terms of looking over your own shoulder or being, you know, uh, reasonable with your, uh, the information you dispense. Well, you know, back when, you know, we worked together on my book initially, and at that time, really what I was proposing about carbohydrates and insulin was still pretty contra was especially controversial back then. It's still a little bit controversial, but it's been more mainstream now. And I did know, uh, I did understand the fact that some of my physician colleagues in a traditional healthcare setting might sort of um, not take to this information very lightly. Um, but I think I sort of um, overestimated that. I was actually, when my colleagues started seeing their patients have in incredible results for making very simple lifestyle changes, they sort of bought into it at that point. So, mm. so I, I think the way we have to approach it is with a very open mind. And I have to say that there are physicians in the movement on this side of the camp or the other that are so um, dogmatic and they're pushing it so hard that they're losing some of that um, ability to sort of bring in more colleagues that would support them. So as much as people could read my book or look at my early work as being anti-plant-based, you know, over half my patient population, because I see a culturally diverse population, a lot of Asian Indians, they're vegetarian, you know? And even when I um, pitched this book to um, Mark, you know, Mark Simpson, you know, I, I thought that, wow, is he gonna really adopt a book that's really the audience demographic is a large percentage of vegetarian Indians in particular, but Mark got it from the beginning, just like you got it, that no, we've got to really get the information out in a way that it can get universally consumed and tailored to everybody's individual circumstance. And, and that's what we as healthcare practitioners have to do. We really can't be extremist on one side of the camp or the other. We've got to find very creative ways to bring people into the center. And there is a center when it comes to health and wellness. I mean, if you bring, and I think you've had people from the plant-based side um, come in and you've talked to them. I think you've talked to Rip before, right? Rip Esselstein. And yeah, we had a great long conversation and uh, talking about what what's amazing is all the common ground. And yep. I appreciate how we're all kind of, it seems like we're settling into um, a message that, you know, getting rid of the processed foods is step number one. And then it's not worth talking about step number two, Dr. Robert Lustig, I had him on my podcast. He did a great job saying, look, you know, the real enemy is big food and pushing these uh, big gulps and uh, vitamin waters and all this nonsense uh, onto the population, contending that it's healthy. And then we're sitting here wasting our energy. Uh, the the plant-based people that are having their kale salads are arguing with the carnivore people having steak and eggs. And it's like, come on now, you know, all of us are, uh, you know, exceeding the, the presidential fitness standard uh, by, by large amounts if we're cutting out processed foods and the rest of it's nuance and uh, honoring your own personal biology, I think is going to be the emerging field of figuring out, Hey, yeah, carnivore style works better for me and vegetarian works better for you, but neither of us are eating snicker bars and big gulps. Oops. I just lost two podcast sponsors, but you know, that's where we should, <laughs> right. that's where we should always head, especially when we're talking about bringing in the average enthusiast who doesn't have all day to obsess about these things. Yep. Hey, I want to give you a specific example because we've had this conversation around this before. So I want to give a little piece of evidence. And this is something I brought up in 
episode 15 of my podcast was well, a study called the Inchianti study. And I want to just bring this up because I think this helps clarify the issue of why we get sort of um, aligned to a certain camp. And then we sort of handpick out evidence from the literature to focus <laughs> on, you know, meat-based diets versus plant-based diets. And first of all, let me give a little bit of background. Um, as many of you might know, when it comes to nutrition studies, baseline nutrition studies are really one of the poorest life forms of research out there because they're predominantly <laughs> based on food frequency questionnaires recall. So Brad, what did you have for lunch a week ago? What, you know, so you're literally just writing down the information about the foods you're consuming. And then researchers will look at that information and make some conclusions based on what you've recorded. And so you know, for example, when you're looking at, let's say, a diet that's heavy in animal meat, what we don't always get is the background story of the fact that these are individuals that are eating processed meats, they're having sodas, French fries, sugar, sweets, other things, but they focus on the animal meat intake. You know, in many studies, they do try to filter out some of that noise, but there's so much noise that you can't even interpret what the conclusion is. And the reason from a mechanistic standpoint of why this is important is because anytime you have a background of chronic hyperinsulinemia, and just to remind the audience, so, you know, insulin is basically the hormone that shuttles nutrients into our different cells, muscle cells, and we need insulin. But when insulin stays elevated, it can cause obesity, heart disease, diabetes, because we have too much of insulin circulating in the bloodstream. Now, most of us, unfortunately, the modern world has some level of chronic hyperinsulinemia. And when you have excess insulin in the body, any nutrient you put in excess inside your body, for example, like protein, for example, saturated fat, all of a sudden those nutrients become potentially toxic because you're in that chronic hyperinsulinemic state. So for example, if you're hyperinsulinemic from eating too many carbs and too much sugar, and then all of a sudden you decide that you're going on a, um, let's say a keto type diet, clearly you're going to be clearing out some of that carbs. But what I find in my clinic is people are still pretty hyperinsulinemic because they haven't cleared all of it out. Now, on top of that, now all of a sudden they're adding a lot of saturated fat to the diet. And then that combination is not going to be advantageous. So this in Chianti study, so I've always sort of said that, gosh, I wish we can take populations of individuals in these studies that are actually adhering to just basic core lifestyle principles. They're not exposed to the modern processed garbage and then look at what the impact on their health is. We still don't have a large scale study that's kind of like that, but let me mm. tell you real, really quickly about the Inchianti study, because this one's interesting, because what they did was they took a thousand seniors, 65 and over in Tuscany, Italy, and they followed them for 20 years and they measured their dietary intake using these food frequency questionnaires. And a long story short, what they found at the end of that period was that animal protein intake was actually inversely associated with mortality, AKA death. Okay. So they found that these seniors who were consuming more animal protein, they actually lived longer, you know, quite frankly, that's what they found. And so this is important to me because you're taking a population in Tuscany that's their seniors. So this means that their core lifestyle values and principles are really more um, um, anti-inflammatory Mediterranean style. They're not basically being exposed to toxic chronic hyperinsulinemia and then them eating extra animal protein, if anything, actually improve longevity. Now, the interesting thing is they looked at the plant-based camp, and this is where some people's blood pressure is going to go up a little bit, but I want to explain here. They found that the plant-based camp that was consuming more plant-based um, or that was having more plant intake, there was actually no protective effect found. But when you dig deeper, they defined the plant intake as mostly cereal grains. And that's not fair. That's an unfair uh, characterization of a plant-based diet, because we know that often these refined cereal grains can cause a little bit of hyperglycemia and chronic hyperinsulinemia. Insulinemia. So this is a perfect example of when you take out that noise of hyperinsulinemia, you can see the effects, the health enhancing effects of something like animal protein or healthy sources of saturated fat. I think in this study, if you look closer, I think plant-based diet got kind of demonized a bit because they were focused on cereal grains and they actually called that out in the study, but that just gives you a nuance. So anytime you guys read nutrition headlines, I want you to dig into how was that study done are we looking at a general population or was this truly a population where there was optimal background with not this hyperinsulinemia, which is just such a great confounder in all these studies. So I know uh, I took some time going into that, but I think this is just a key point that we need to understand. 
Yeah, it's super important because we get so uh, diluted by the media and the headlines and even the experts uh, touting the confirmation bias of the studies that uh, support them and, and trashing the, um, the other stuff. Maybe it's uh, better to do a little self-experimentation along with blood work and um, seeing how you perform with a 30 day uh, plant restriction experiment, which has been so successful for the, uh, the, the carnivore folks that had uh, plant reactivity or uh, whatever it is, uh, maybe, maybe eating less food for 30 days and seeing how much better you feel and how much better your, your blood numbers look. Totally. And you know, on top of that, um, the use of the continuous glucose monitors has been a game changer mm. in my practice, just getting people to strap the sensor on and really see what the impacts of these foods is doing. And I've actually had the opportunity now through my healthcare system to actually scale that out. So now really I'm equipping um, companies and employees in small pilots right now with glucose sensors. And we are teaching them how to use this tool effectively to make personalized individual decisions around their health. And this is where we find that for some individuals, oatmeal in the morning has absolutely no adverse impact on their health. Their glucose is not going up, which means they're not chronically hyperinsulinemic. Fantastic. Others are finding from that sort of food that their glucose is going way up and they've got to do some things to really improve their insulin sensitivity. And that, 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 that I think is going to be a game changer is we have more of these sorts of sensors on the market. And I'm not actually a fan of wearing sensors, you know, year round, every single day, mm -hmm. like my um, good friend, Peter Atia. I actually use it like as an intervention for maybe a couple of months to get me on track and learn some things about the different foods I'm consuming. But then once you develop that intuition and you know what's good for you, you take the sensor off and you live your life. But I think, you know, these sensors are a game changer. And I'm trying to get more doctors to understand how to use these and prescribe these because right now, again, in a traditional healthcare system, glucose sensors are only used in severe diabetics who are on insulin right. um, and need to be monitored um, often. So, so I think this is going to be a big um, changer in terms of the area of personalizing your nutrition to your own body type. I want to tell you about Inside Tracker, an awesome new ultra personalized nutrition and lifestyle program that combines data from your comprehensive blood panels, genetic test results, and lifestyle and fitness data from a Fitbit, for example, and organizes everything into one super cool online portal of your personal health. I am just getting going with this, and it's awesome. It has everything in one spot. For every blood result, you can click on a blog post or watch a video to learn more about these values. It's a great education in general health and self-quantification, and it was developed by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometric data from MIT, Tufts, and Harvard. The patented Inside Tracker algorithm calculates your so called inner age, and it shows each biomarker as either optimized, needs to improve, or at risk. And then you can take precise corrective action with a science backed plan to reach your performance goals. Oh, mercy, people. On my first round of testing, guess what my inner age was? 62. Shocker, because I just turned 56. I'm sorry. You know what? When I delivered that blood test, I believe I was a little overtired and several of my biomarkers were deemed to be subpar. So I made some changes as directed. I recovered better, rested, went back and delivered way better numbers at the next blood test. The Inside Tracker motto is change is an inside job and that is for real you got to keep tabs on this stuff to be at your best and they have an amazing deal just for brad podcast listeners they are going to give away a grand prize of fifteen hundred dollars in inside tracker value so to enter all you have to do is go to inside tracker.com slash brad pod b-r-a-d-p-o-d check it out right now at the link and enter the contest yeah it's great that they'd come into immediate public access where you can sign up right now um uh, with uh, NutriSense or Levels Health. I've had experts from both of those operations on the podcast and talked about it at length and had some fun experimenting with my own. And I realized after, I think, three trips through the the two-week life of the sensor, um, not much was, uh, was bumping it or, or causing any trouble. And that's when I realized, okay, just like you described, I've done enough um, self-analysis now. I can go on and live my life and realize that perhaps my exercise routine or the absence of process 
processed foods is protecting me from um, anything that you could consider adverse from the day that I decide to binge on popcorn uh, at night instead of go about my merry way and stop eating after dark and, and all those great things that we're recommending. And so that was, um, you know, that was an eye opener for me that um, if you if you cover a lot of the bases, you're, you're going to do pretty well. And I think it, that same category goes for that same insight goes for um, the extreme disparity between, for example, my podcast guest, Rip Esselstyn, and, and the way that I eat with the, with the ancestral model. Um, he's out there breaking world records in master swimming. I'm doing my best in master's track and field, but he's a picture of health and it works for him. And he probably has some uh, genetic adaptability to a, a plant-based diet that's highly restrictive where it might screw up some other people. Um, yep. But I guess- Maybe I should ask, like, are there any blind sides we need to think about in uh, outside of, let's say, a great string of results with a CGM and an improvement in blood work due to dietary modification? And we have our reports from, let's say, the past six months or the past three years. Are there any secret things that could come back to, to haunt us later? Because a lot of people, you know, will say, oh, Brad, you're eating so much red meat. Um, you might be sorry 30 years down the line. And it seems to me like flawed and dated information that they're, they're spewing. Yep. Yeah. And coming back, we can knock off the red meat first. And again, th that's really going to be that background context of chronic hyperinsulinemia. So, so as long as the sourcing of the meat is good and the background of chronic hyperinsulinemia is gone, um, I don't see any evidence where we'd be concerned about that, but blind spots is really important to pay attention to. And I have to say that the blind spots would come in the form. There's two that I'm thinking of, uh, of the top of my head. And one of them is um, nutrient deficiencies, so micronutrient deficiencies. So if we're just, um, for example, fasting, or if we're eating a little bit of a diet that can be restrictive in certain ways that we're not aware of. And I'll give you an example. Even some of my patients that have made great changes, when I do a bit of an intake around the types of plants, for example, that they're consuming, often they're just doing bagged greens because they're so darn easy, right? They just buy greens from the grocery store and they're using that and maybe getting one other color in their diet and nothing else. Or, you know, because of the convenience, they're just fixated on three or four different types of um, different foods, or they're just sticking to muscle meats and not eating other parts of the animal that can provide so many great nutrients. So I think those are things that you're not going to get from a standard blood test. They're not easy to really measure that. So we want to really diversify that diet. And I think you've done a tremendous job of really exposing that through a lot of your work about the potential, um, you know, benefits you can get from eating different parts of animals and really diversifying that diet. But that's something we really want to pay attention to. To because you can't get that from a regular blood test. The other part is what I brought up before is most people still don't have a good sense of what's happening to their muscle mass. So basically as they're doing these diets and they're aiming for the number on the scale to go down, they're not aware that they are losing significant months of muscle mass, maybe in their legs or other parts of their body. And we know that muscle mass is correlated with longevity. So for any of you out there that is doing fasting or some sort of diet that's restrictive, to me, like exercise is important, but exercise is actually especially an important audit to make sure that, you know, I'm doing this diet, but wow, doing like mm. lunges is much more difficult now, or, you know, squats, I'm not making any progress despite the fact that I'm resistance training. So with my patients, when they bring in their spreadsheets, again, I practice in Silicon Valley. So people will literally bring in Excel spreadsheets of the last 20 years of data. And I'm, and they're like micromanaging every nuance, Brad, of their LDL, what happened to the A1C. And I'm like, you know, more power to you. Great. Data is fantastic. But I literally said that I want you to add a couple of columns here. And these columns are super important. One column I want you to add, what is sort of your internal audit of muscle strength? Is it how many squats mm. you can do? What's your internal audit of balance? I want to see sort of how that's progressing. So add that column. The second column is aerobic endurance. We can do all these things, but there's no simple blood test that's going to tell me that, Brad, your aerobic endurance is actually improving. So if I've got a patient that does a neighborhood two-mile walk, I want to know how fast you can do that walk or light jog as long as you're mostly breathing lightly through your mouth or staying within our math heart rate if we're focused on that. And I want to see your times by the time I see you next time, are your times actually improving? Because we can do a lot of this stuff and game our numbers to look good, but we might be losing muscle mass and strength, which is really so key for longevity and quality of life because we're still um, fixated in front of a computer. And now in our Zoom world, people are becoming more deconditioned. 
you're not going to measure that through a blood test. So we need a quantitative way to assess those factors, which are at least as important, if not more important for longevity and quality of life. So, so I think those are the blind spots that I'd probably highlight and prioritize the most. Oh my gosh. I love that. And it reminds me of that, um, that large study from Cooper Institute and Texas A&M, where they measured um, one's time in the mile run at age 50. Speaking of age 50, Dr. Ron, congratulations. Okay, now it's time to go out there with the stopwatch because they, um, they argued that the predictability for longevity and the chances of living healthily till age 80 was super strongly correlated with one's time in the mile, more so than any of the um, other markers like blood pressure and and blood work. And so um, I believe superior category was males breaking eight minutes for the mile, females breaking nine minutes. And then if you were slower than 12 minute male, 13 minute female, you were in the uh, the high risk category. And this is, again, um, it's an all out effort, you know, one time going four laps and, you know, eight minutes is pretty fast. Nine minutes is pretty fast. My sister was really pissed because on her 50th birthday, we took her to the track and she ran like a nine fifteen. And I said, you know <laughs> what? Um, you can hike the, uh, the Inca trail in Peru. I think you're going to get a, a full score there. Uh, <laughs> but there's also other tests, um, you know, for push-up competency or, or, or squat competency, if, if that's more of your athletic interest, but something as a marker that you go and repeat and, you know, hope to, to maintain competency over time. My mom's doing, um, osteo strong, the, uh, the, the fitness oh, yeah, facility that. that's uh, predicated on uh, maintaining uh, muscle density and uh, uh, lean, lean bone mass. I mean, <laughs> lean muscle mass and bone density. Uh, and they, you know, they go in once a week and measure your output and see if you're getting stronger uh, or weaker. And the program has, you know, been really successful for uh, appealing to seniors because the exercises are really safe and you're static and you're supporting your weight. Uh, but there's so many ways that you can you can track um, the aging in a, in a straightforward manner, right in your face. I love that. So pairing that with blood work, of course, because I, I feel concerned for the, the athletic freaks that have, you know, adverse blood values and they, they ignore them because they just finished an ultra marathon. So what could possibly be wrong? Oh, that's true. Yeah, you're right. So, so the, the other side of it, we see a lot too, where people are solely fixated on their fitness numbers, right? It's strength, it's this, but all of a sudden I see their blood work. It tells a different story. You know, sometimes I'll check that C-reactive protein was, which mm. is a marker of inflammation. And then in many of my patients that are overtraining, that inflammation marker can come back quite high because they're mm. just really tapping out their mitochondrial horsepower and their engine. They're creating a lot of oxidative byproducts that doesn't always show up in the lab. So I wouldn't say mm. that, you know, if you're doing a lot of training, if your CRP test is normal, that you're out of the woods, definitely not. Cause there's still a lot of um, free radicals that can be generated that we just can't easily measure in the lab, but I want to come back. I'm so glad you brought up the Cooper um, study, because I think that's the one that really crystallizes exactly what you said in terms of endurance will trump any deviations in LDL blood pressure and all those metrics in so many ways, although we want to maintain those numbers, but also for a lot of my patients that no matter what I do, they're never going to run a mile. They're not even going to go to a track. Like you said, it's sort of just find something that you enjoy. And that could be you um, hiking a certain trail nearby. That could be you playing a tennis match. Like everybody has an intuitive Mm. sense of how out of breath do I get if I play tennis for 20 minutes or, you know, you're like the master speed golfer, right? So speed golf is something a lot of my patients aren't aware of. And I actually brought up (laughs) that that concept. I can't believe that, Ron. Can you imagine that? aware of the greatest sport. Yeah, I know. How could that even happen? But I actually got a couple of my patients to do that. Like when they go out in the evening and the sun's down and the course is empty, I'm like, you know what? Don't fix it on your golf game. Just try to see how long it takes you to finish nine holes. And not surprisingly, you know, this firsthand, many of them find that their scores are better than they always were before because they're not overthinking their golf swing. They're trying to actually beat their time, which is kind of an interesting way to think about golf. So I think there's so many creative opportunities to create that baseline metric that you can improve upon. And then that's going to bring enjoyment and long-term sustainability than hitting a track if that's not your thing. Yeah. Good, good point. I also noticed that there seems to be a, um, a defeatist mentality in our culture where we're just really, uh, overly accepting of this decline that, uh, we all must agree that's accelerated from what we're truly capable of as humans, but so many people are content to be on the sidelines just because of their age or, 
maybe because of a, uh, you know, they notice a little attrition in their performance. And so they, they hang it up forever rather than recalibrating their goals and finding something that's age appropriate. And we definitely need age appropriate challenges that are, that are safe and, and interesting and fun, but it, it seems worthwhile for everyone to set their sights on something. And, oh my gosh, my dad had the most graceful decline into a nice long life of 97 years. Uh, but he was going from, you know, walking 18 holes to uh, going in a cart for 18 holes to uh, playing nine holes, uh, walking around the half mile loop at the park every day uh, to walking half of that loop to walking to the picnic bench and sitting down and waiting for uh, the others to finish their walk. But at least he got up and, and got out every day. And, you know, everything was a bit of a challenge. Uh, at an appropriate and graceful uh, pace all the way till, you know, he's walking uh, back and forth laps across the backyard instead of a half mile loop around the park. But we got to We got to do something and not uh, throw in the towel and, totally. and tell stories and watch the Super Bowl on TV. <laughs> <laughs> totally agreed. Uh, so back to that thing we mentioned a while back about um, your own experience with overdosing on all the fun stuff. And you mentioned the, the breathing, uh, the cold exposure, the high intensity interval training workouts, uh, the fasting, the intermittent fasting. And when you stack those all up, and I've talked about this on my show before, so my listeners might be familiar. It's like, those are a lot of stress factors stacked together. Um, I usually throw my age in there cause I'm trying to do these, uh, high intensity workouts in the, in the 50 plus age group. Um, but I noticed on, on numerous occasions over my, over my journey that, um, seemingly there was too much stress there and I had to rethink some of these fantastic, wonderful, uh, peak performance strategies for, uh, for, uh, boosting, um, health. Yep. I mean, I've definitely been, okay. If, if we think about all these different modalities from exercise to breath work, to cold exposure, all the wonderful tools that are out there, I kind of think of each of these interventions as being a pill, you know, a healthy form of a drug. And one of the concepts we think about with drugs is obviously having an efficacious, effective dose where you're going to get the best um, results versus a toxic dose that's going to cause side effects. So the way when we actually manage patients with medications, a patient that's, that need medications for say their blood pressure is we will often put them on a dual pill, like a pill that's got uh, more than one ingredient. And the importance of doing that is because you're minimizing the toxicity or side effects of just putting somebody on too much of one particular um, chemical. And we have to take that same sort of view when it comes to these interventions that we use. So when I went through my type A process of trying to optimize all these different lifestyle pills, <laughs> I started doing Wim Hof, you know, which I actually loved, but I, I sort of got obsessed with it. So for those of you that, that aren't familiar with the Wim Hof, it's a combination of cold exposure and doing breath, um, breath holding type exercises. So I was doing that. I was doing a lot of um, high intensity um, exercise. I was doing some weightlifting on top of that. And there was a period of time when I was doing that where I was like, oh my God, I'm feeling superhuman. Like some of my one rep maxes are the best they've ever been. And there was adrenaline flooding through my system, like continuously, which felt great. And as mm -hmm. all of us know, adrenaline is a very addictive substance. But then as I started paying attention after a few months to my sleep, how I actually looked in the mirror, I was getting really gone. I mean, I felt like I'd aged, uh, but I was still, still so hooked on the sensation that I didn't even acknowledge what was happening. But then at a certain point, I just stopped because I was like, you know what? I'm actually not feeling very happy. Yes, I might be getting great results on my one rep max for some of the exercises I'm doing, but just intuitively, I felt like I was just overdoing it. So when I started peeling back those different interventions, um, I started regaining my health again. My energy was better. My sleep got better. And I realized that I was overdosing on a poly pill. It was literally all these things together in very high doses. And I was doing the opposite of what we do, what we do in the pharmaceutical industry, where you start off with smaller doses of combining these. So, so now I've really evolved to using cold exposure very strategically. I still do some breath holding here and there, but just other types of light breath work. But when you can combine a couple of these different strategies together, you're going to get amazing results from it, but you're not going to be dying because you're not surging your system with adrenaline to the point where you're going to end up having a burnout effect from this together. And for every individual, they've just got to experiment with different modalities. And typically when my patients start off and they haven't tried any of these things, 
I do kind of have them do light versions of a little bit, like get used to a little bit of cold exposure, maybe try a little bit of breath work, you know, don't start full swing with fasting as well to start that in more of a light way. Cause again, I have a lot of type A's where if I don't set boundaries, they might try to do all of this stuff at maximal dosages. So I think really um, combining these in an optimal way is going to be very critical. Oh, sure. More is better. Come on. I remember just enjoying my chest freezer plunges so much and thinking that, well, as I build my resilience and my focus, and my adaptability, um, I can continue to, to go longer and longer. And I got up to six minutes if I was timing myself trying to show off or, or four to five minutes routinely in the water that was uh, somewhere between 36 and 40 degrees. I kept it chilled at that level and I felt fine and it was no trouble. Uh, but then I think over time, and I remember had a few distinct occasions where, you know, I do my morning cold exposure, I do a sprint workout, and then later that same afternoon, I crashed and burned and had a weird sensation of feeling tired and achy and having to go down and take a nap. And it happened in, on, on a few occasions where I finally realized, you know what, maybe that is too much to, uh, to throw the sprint and the cold exposure and, and pack them together. Uh, not to mention if one is uh, fasting or experimenting with the ketogenic diet, which I was doing when we were working on the book. And, um, you know, the, the takeaway from that is like, uh, these diets, I know you have a whole episode about it, so you'll probably jump in here, but, um, maybe those diets have more benefit to offer for someone who has that metabolic damage and that constantly full glycogen and high insulin production versus me. I'm already going out to the track and, and depleting all my glycogen. And so if yeah. I'm, if I'm restricting my carbs as well, uh, again, it can work for a lot of people, but you're, you're putting up a lot of stress factors onto the scoreboard. Totally. I'm so glad you were open and honest about the impact of that. Cause I got to say, j just going back to our success bias, when I saw you in that ice cold water, I'm like, I'm a loser, man. How could I not have, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was doing something wrong. I'm like, I need to cold adapt more. Maybe I should like sleep overnight and, you know, in a meat freezer or something to adapt myself, but it's good. To, it's good to hear that even you have your um, um, limits in terms of how much you can endure some of these things. And I think for the listeners out there, just realize that again, if, if we're let, let's focus on cold exposure for a second, because this is one thing that I, I've seen some of my patients get into trouble with, but really all you're trying to do with cold exposure is you're just trying to induce a shiver response. So when mm -hmm. you're in the shower and you turn the water cold, you just want to get yourself to shiver 45 seconds, 60 seconds. Great. And then don't, don't, don't fight the shiver, like let yourself shiver, step out of the shower, then you can come back in. But in the beginning, for somebody who's never done this before, even doing a couple of rounds of that is going to already cause the biochemical changes for you to actually start unlocking a little bit of that extra stored fat. And just to get into a little bit of science here, there is a hormone inside our fat cells, an enzyme switch, sorry, called hormone sensitive light base or HSL. And anytime we activate our sympathetic nerve system through cold exposure or exercise, we turn on that switch and that allows those extra fat cells and so our fat cells to actually get released into the bloodstream. And you don't have to bombard the system to turn that switch on. You just want to add just enough of a stress activator to really turn that switch on. So that can be just very short doses of cold exposure in the shower. It can be micro workouts, which you're the master of. And I love doing my, you know, I call it micro dosing on exercise. Just doing a little bit of that fidgeting and micro dosing is enough to turn on those circuits and turn on that HSL, the hormone sensitive light base. And you can get some fat flow just from doing that. Um, and this is something I'm really teaching to my folks that are working from home because a lot of them are all or nothing. They're either, they're sitting in front of the computer for back-to-back -back Zooms for eight hours, and then we'll go to a workout in the evening, or maybe they'll start off in the morning. But I tell them, you've just missed out on 14 hours of meeting time where you could have been moving your legs, you know, doing these micro workouts, you know, squat lunges, whatever, you know, now that we're at home, my gosh, sometimes, you know, meeting gets canceled. You've got your shower right here. I couldn't shower at work before. <laughs> like turn the water on cold and jump in for 10 minutes before your next meeting. And you yeah. feel like a new person. So we have incredible opportunities in our own home environment to really um, just flip the switch on HSL in low doses. Because what happens is in the morning, if you do a super high intensity, cold exposed workout, you might feel great, 
but often you will find that you might kind of crash like overdose and caffeine um, early in the morning by the afternoon. And I look at my day is literally like um, a game that's built with like two or three quarters throughout the day. So in my morning period, this is what I want to accomplish. And I just want to make sure I don't burn out before that's over. You know, I might take a slight break. Maybe that's going to be my cold shower. Maybe it's going to be some deep rest or maybe it's just walking the dog. Then I come in for quarter two. And now this is what I'm going to do there. So most of my patients, the whole day, they're like, if this is a game, they're like in the game with no rest period. Steph Curry's playing mm. all four quarters with no rest <laughs> periods at all. And then they're trashed by the end of the day. And now they're overactivated, exhausted. They might not sleep well. But having that opportunity to really break up the day into quarters is a huge game changer. It's helped me so much. It's helped a lot of my patients. I didn't even know that was a possibility that they can do. So what are you doing uh, between quarters to kind of ebb and flow the the intensity of the fight or flight stimulation and the, the stress hormones? Yep. So a few of those things are going to be either breath work. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and if I can't get outside for whatever reason, cause I have a short interval, um, I am doing some deep diaphragmatic breathing or some other sorts of breath techniques to sort of get me recentered again. I can always take my lap out uh, laptop if I need to outside for the next meeting, but in between I might go walk the dog. I might do a couple of right up and down the street to do some very short sprints or just do fast walking for 10 or 15 minutes, just enough activity to really get things moving there too. So that's another tactic, but you know, there's endless things. And, and you know, obviously with the amount of body work that I do, sometimes I'm, you know, doing different sorts of leg based activities exercises, balance exercises. You know, I think both of us have really gotten in the knees over toes. So there's specific things that I'm doing as part of the knees over toes program to really kind of enhance um, my knee strength and leg strength as well to hamstrings as well. So there's a whole menu of things that you can basically create throughout those windows of time. And then the other one really is something that many of us don't do, which is our creative pursuits. So I, I have a guitar in my office as well, too. I don't get to play the guitar very often, but sometimes I have 15 or 20 minutes I'll play some chords or work on my scales. I might do that outside, or I might think of something creative or call up a friend or somebody I haven't connected with in a while. It's really easy to sort of ditch those things, but those are other forms of rest that our brain needs so we can recover in time. So just identifying different opportunities for that sort of brain rest is really key. Uh, and then when you're talking about the micro workouts and um, the cold shower in the afternoon when your energy is in a lull, so you're, you're, you're triggering an appropriately brief fight or flight stimulation. And then I guess generally does the body kind of recalibrate with uh, a parasympathetic response to kind of make you chill and relax after your micro workout in the ensuing hours or after your cold shower? That's exactly right. Because if the dose is short enough and it's not too intense, um, then that's exactly what happens is your parasympathetic recovery will be quicker. Whereas a lot of times you're doing su something super high intensity, you will get still a parasympathetic relaxation response, but often that is proportional to how intense your actual initial exercise trigger was. So often you'll find that if you did a super high intensity workout, the crash after that is, you know, pretty significant also. But with these small workouts or lower dose type activities, what you find is it's almost, you know, imperceptible. Like you get a nice little um, nudge from that workout or that mini micro workout that you just did, but then you're nice and even after that. And that's mm. really key because the other thing that's really key for us to understand is when we do these adrenaline driving type workouts and exposures is it can actually have a significant impact on our hunger. So often we end up craving a lot more calories and high energy foods, which usually come in the forms of carbs and sugars. And many of my patients, they don't realize that that high adrenaline driving workout is actually making caloric restriction and fasting really difficult. And people are often binging into the late afternoon and evening. So be aware that sometimes it is that sort of workout that can actually trigger that. Whereas when we're microdosing and do these lower intensity movements throughout the day, usually you're just leaking out enough free fatty acids from your fat cells to help deflate those fat cells, but it's also enough to keep the body satiated and the brain satiated. So it doesn't feel like it needs to overfill. Oh my gosh. That's a huge one right there because there's so much frustration involved with dropping excess body fat. And I talk, I did a whole episode on, uh, on my podcast called the fatty popcorn boy saga, which is when I had to drop <laughs> Love 10 pounds of excess body fat that somehow creeped on that. I didn't represent the number on my driver's license for the first time in my adult life. I'm like, what's going on here. But I'll tell you on the days when I would do, um, a really difficult, prolonged high jump training session, 
session, probably too long because I get so excited out there. Oh my gosh, the food intake is uh, so increased that those are not the days where I'm making big progress on my body composition goals. I think they help overall and they help with uh, the genetic signaling to, um, to stay lean and, and maintain lean muscle mass. But when you tiptoe over that line, of uh, sensibility with the choice of workout, I think you pay the price with um, excess caloric intake and increased laziness in the in the hours that follow as well. Totally. Oh yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. And for th those of you fasters out there, really be aware of that. Since I see a lot of these individuals in my clinic, many of them can easily or effortlessly do their 16 or 18 hour fast but they right. end up just going to town during that eating window. And they just, you know, <laughs> they really go nuts during that. And, you know, there's data to show that that's probably still better than them, obviously eating mm. junk foods throughout the day, but sometimes the intensity and that hunger are just so, um, it, it's so out of control and people feel like just because they fasted 16 hours, their body's justified to do that. Um, it, it's a big problem. So, so that's the other thing is, um, many of my individuals, and these are blind spots, they're eating the wrong types of inflammatory foods during that window. And then, like I said, because they're not getting adequate exercise, they're also losing muscle mass on top of that. So really right. silently in the background, even though they're losing weight, they're eating inflammatory foods. Um, you know, they're not eating the right types of foods while they are um, eating during their eating window. They're gently starting to lose a little bit of muscle mass. Their metabolism is starting to slow down a little bit. And then when they rebound on a vacation or they decide not to fast mm. for a few weeks, they end up gaining a lot of body mm. fat. They're in worse shape than, than they were before this unsustainable fast. So be aware of those patterns. Yeah. Listeners go, uh, hit that episode on meta health podcast about the, um, taking fasting, uh, out of control yeah. or to, to your detriment where you detail a lot of those things, but I love the, um, the observation of the indiscriminate food choices because you're celebrating because you're so badass because you only eat one meal a day. And so it's like, yeah, lay it on me. Let me have seven courses. And, um, you're right. It's if, if you're doing it within reason, it's still, um, that feast or famine cycle, I think is, um, a really great, uh, a strategy and insight that, um, if we can bank a lot of hours fasted and then we can enjoy, um, rich, indulgent meals, even to the extent Ben Greenfield talks about this of like having his cake and eating it too, meaning he banks a lot of hours in a ketogenic state. He performs fasted workouts. And then in the evenings he's hanging out with his kids and they're making all these concoctions in the kitchen. And he might hit a, a whole bunch of uh, carbohydrate grams in, in one sitting. Uh, but that not only ensures that he recovers from, his workouts uh, earlier in the day for the next day. Uh, but it's done at, at, at one dose. And like we see on the continuous glucose monitors, um, it's okay. Those guys do a good job communicating this idea that it's okay to see your blood glucose spike after a meal. That's what your body's supposed to do. You just want to see it return to baseline, uh, yeah. rather than snacking and reaching for the candy bowl at the front desk, uh, you know, throughout the day at the office. Hey, the, uh, you just reminded me of something else too. When we talk about blind spots, one blind spot, Brad, that we see on lab tests is we often get very fixated on that hemoglobin A1C number. And that basically is your composite score for your average sugars for the last two to three months. And one thing I'm finding that when people get A1Cs done and they're quote normal to on the low side and they pat themselves on the back that, hey, my A1C is 5.1, 5.2, and they're like, great. But sometimes what I've found, especially in my patients that are complaining all about, about a lot of fatigue, is when you put these sensors on, people are not aware of the significant glucose fluctuations that they have. A lot of them are getting hypoglycemic, low blood sugar during the night or the second half of the afternoon. And I'm finding people that are doing fasting in the pattern that we talked about where they're fasting, and then they're all of a sudden high glycemic during their eating window, even though their average sugar is fine, when you look at the tracing and the curve of how their glucose goes up and down, that's not healthy at all. And the thing is you have so many glucose lows that is bringing their average A1C composite mm. score to a quote normal level. But studies show that these swings in glucose, they can create tre uh, tremendous adrenal stress. It causes an increase in catecholamines and stress hormones in the body because our body likes to be stable. Our brain likes to see, obviously you're going to get normal glucose fluctuations, 
But when those are exaggerated, our brain does not like that. And that can cause fatigue, fogginess, some of the cognitive decline that we talked about earlier. I've seen that in my case too. I wish I'd worn a CGM when I did my overdosing on Wim Hop and all those things. I'm sure I would have had definite nighttime hypoglycemic excursions, but be aware that for many of us hard drivers, we are getting a lot of hypo episodes. And that's where being very consistent with your eating, making sure, like you said, that you're getting adequate starches to fuel some of your workouts are going to be really important. Uh, so what is prompting those hypoglycemic episodes in a seemingly healthy person? Why can't we keep it um, stable at 84 to 100 or, or whatever if we're dropping below the, the threshold, not uh, already recognizing the, um, the dangers of having hyperglycemic episodes and, and uh, running at a, at a high battery power with your, your baseline number too high, but what's going on on the other end? Yeah. So, so there's a couple of things. Um, so, so one is the C word is, is cortisol for most of my patients. And I've actually seen that during more high stress periods when my sleep is disrupted and I'm just having a lot of baseline work and life stress, even if my diet is pretty sound, I end up seeing more glucose fluctuations. I don't get many highs, but I'm very susceptible to developing more lows. And I see that in my patients as well. The other thing too, is when you think about the insulin roller coaster, right? Because some people, um, if they are doing a lot of fasting and then all of a sudden they have something a little bit higher glycemic, their sugar may not go up as much, but the insulin response to that is sort of exaggerated sometimes. So then the glucose drops down. We see the same thing with high intensity exercise. It's almost the same effect as eating a high glycemic food where initially you get this surge in glucose, but then afterwards, if we're not fueling appropriately, or if our mm. glycogen stores were low before that high intensity exercise, we end up seeing a crash in that too. Now, people that are really well fat adapted, their body is more resilient to these fluctuations in workout intensity, their glycemic variability is less, meaning their sugar is more stable. But other people, again, sleep deprived, high stress, body's not completely fat adapted. We can often see these things happen. And, you know, many of my patients that have sleep issues, they don't realize that around two, three in the morning, their glucose is actually tanking, you know, compared to Ooh. what their glucose was at bedtime. And that's causing a lot of adrenal stress. And they all of a sudden pop up out of bed, you know, they go to the bathroom, they can't fall back asleep. There's a lot of reasons why people get up at three in the morning. I'm not saying this is the only one, but yeah. sometimes that glucose variability during the night can be a factor that we sometimes sometimes un uncover when people wear these sensors during the nighttime. Oh, before I let you go, doctor question on that, on that topic, is it, is it true that, um, uh, adrenal stress will inappropriately stimulate the kidneys to make you think you have to get up and pee at three in the morning? Yeah, that can, that, that can absolutely be a response. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we, you know, a, a layman's term for this, we kind of call this a hyperactive or an irritable bladder, but people that definitely are in that stress state that can cause you to get up. The other thing too, and it's more of a complex mechanism is many of us have very mild sleep disordered breathing, anybody that's not breathing sufficiently during the nighttime. So this can be full blown, blown sleep apnea, which a lot of people are end up getting. It's becoming an epidemic where you're not getting adequate oxygen to the lungs while you're sleeping. So apnea means you're stopping breathing. Thing. But even those of us that might have blocked nasal passages or something else that is really interfering with our breathing during the night, that can actually send a signal through our heart to our um, kidneys to actually release more urine to actually get rid of some of that extra fluid. So individuals that actually correct sleep apnea or might be able to do things to improve their breathing during the nighttime, often they find that they're not getting up during the nighttime. So actually, if you go to my blog, there's actually an ebook on sleep that I have on there. It's a free ebook. I interviewed one of the world's foremost um, individuals who's done so much work in this area. And there's resources on 3M wakings. And I talk about sort of the impact of breathing. That's been something that I didn't know about before. Poor Brad, and I'm uncovering a lot of people with sleep disorder, breathing issues. When they fix that, often, you know, mouth taping is another popular trend I talk about in that um, ebook as well, too. Sometimes getting up in the night just goes away once we improve oxygenation during sleep. Oh, love it. I've had great success putting the nasal strips on as needed. I don't want to become uh, dependent on them, but if I'm traveling or in a new environment, sometimes your nose gets stuffed up in a hotel or whatever, and um, keeping that nose breathing going by, uh, by any means necessary seems like a great strategy. We know that's so much better than opening the mouth. Totally. Okay. So we got a free ebook over there at culturalhealthsolutions.com, a fantastic website with awesome blog articles that I, I believe you actually wrote, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yes, all of them are written by me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and of course the podcast. So um, tell us how we can connect with you in every way and uh, follow your work. Totally. Yeah. The culturalhealthsolutions.com is the, the best website. So I write pretty actively on there. There's several eBooks that people have been accessing there. And then the Meta Health podcast, you'll see the link to that directly on the website. Or if you go to iTunes, or your favorite podcast platform, just look up Meta Health podcast with my name on it. And um, yeah, tell me what you think. I hope it benefits you a lot. Oh, you're going to love it, listener, and go leave a review. It really helps. This is a relatively new show. It's skyrocketing to the top of the rankings, deservedly so. So I'm so glad (laughs) to connect with you again. Dr. Ron Sinha, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Hey, listeners, I want to tell you about an interesting product from Paleo Valley apple cider vinegar capsules this product allows you to enjoy all the healing properties of apple cider vinegar in your daily diet without the hassle or the burning that comes when you try to swallow it directly and the healing properties are many they're well validated you've probably heard how apple cider vinegar helps with blood glucose control breaking down amino acids for better absorption and general digestive health and nutrient assimilation The Paleo Valley Apple Cider Vinegar Complex adds other healing spices like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and lemon for more digestive health. As a whole, this formulation has a lot of research-backed validation that you'll improve blood pressure, cardiovascular health, and disease prevention, and profound benefits for insulin sensitivity, satiety and hunger management, glucose regulation, and fat metabolism. The apple cider vinegar complex is a great idea to take when you're traveling and eating different foods, giving your digestive system the boost it needs. Everything in the bottle is organic, and the formula has been carefully fermented into potent acetic acid, which confers the aforementioned health benefits. Why don't you try some? Go to paleovalley.com and take that 15% discount with the code BRAD15. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkerns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.